2023 was one of the most impactful years for paleontology in recent memory, and I'm thrilled to be part of this installment of Paleo Rewind. I'm the Vividen over at Vividen Paleontology Evolved, and I'm covering July. Our first highlighted study is an analysis of molting in Paneraptoran dinosaurs, a clade that includes the lovely chicken parrots, dromaeosaurids, and modern birds. Molting is the process by which feathered animals shed old feathers to make way for new ones, since feathers don't repair themselves and need to be completely replaced when damaged or worn. Complete molting in modern birds is normally on an annual cycle, but it's very difficult to determine in fossil animals. The only confirmed molting dinosaur fossil we have is a single specimen of a microraptor, which was replacing some primary feathers in its right wing when it died. The study's authors, Yosef Kiat and Jingmai Kathleen O'Connor, performed a survey of 92 other fossils of non-avian and avian dinosaurs, searching for indications of molting, and they found none. Interestingly, the statistical distribution of preserved molt traces mirrors the proportions of modern bird collections that engage in rapid simultaneous molting, which is a much faster process and is less likely to be preserved. This indicates that early Paneraptoran dinosaurs may have engaged in very short, quick molting periods, with the longer-lasting sequential molting evolving in more derived birds later on. Now we go back in time even further to the Cambrian, the period when the brain children of George Lucas ruled the oceans. You can't look at Opa Binia and tell me that it doesn't belong in Moss Eisley Cantina using its face as a space saxophone. I mean, come on. Anyway, a paper led by Russell D.C. Bicknell took a look at the world's first apex predator, Anomalocaris, the abnormal shrimp. While not a shrimp, this spike tentacled faced beastie was certainly abnormal. In a world filled with small crawling critters, it was a three foot long carnivorous swimmer. And despite its recent portrayal as a trilobite cruncher in the Netflix series Life on Our Planet, this study indicates that its raptorial appendages weren't designed for piercing armor. They actually would have been damaged if they'd tried. Instead, biomechanical modeling based on giant vinegaroons and tailless whip scorpions shows that they were better adapted for rapid capture of soft-bodied prey. Ecologically, it seems most likely that Anomalocaris hunted soft animals that swam in the water column, although other related radiodonts may have been better adapted for durophagy. The Permian, in my opinion, is the most underrated prehistoric time period, mainly because it produced the Gorgonopsids, one of the coolest animal groups ever. They were carnivorous therapsids ranging from small dog to bear size, and are famous for their iconic saber teeth. They may have even had parietal eyes, light-sensitive patches on the tops of their skulls seen in some modern reptiles like tuataras. And while this description isn't reflective of their actual taxonomic status, I like to think of gorgonopsids as reptilian saber wolves. A study published on July 7th described a gorgonops skeleton with relatively complete postcranial material, allowing for study of its morphology and inference of its ecology. This individual would have weighed about 98 kilograms, and its well-preserved forelimbs are proportionally similar to those of the cat-like ambush predator Thylacosmilus. Vendel and her team speculate that the overall build of the animal indicates that gorgonopsids were ambush predators that used their powerful hind limbs to pin down their prey before finishing them off with their saber teeth. Quite the evocative image. Another July highlight examines how archosaur nesting strategies gradually changed from crocodile-like to bird-like. Hogan and Ferricchio's analysis points out that crocodilians are ectotherms that bury their eggs in vegetation, which rots and outputs enough heat to successfully incubate the eggs. Birds, on the other hand, are endotherms that use contact incubation to regulate egg temperature. So how did archosaurs evolve from one behavioral extreme to the other? As it turns out, the fossil record of Paneraptoran dinosaur eggs shows partially buried eggs, exactly what you'd predict to find as a transitional behavior between crocodile-like and bird-like nesting. Partial burial confers advantages like temperature regulation, camouflage, and the ability of the parent to check on the eggs without needing to dig them out of the ground. Some shorebirds still do that today. Speaking of crocodile-like, a new species of alligator was described from the quaternary of Thailand. Gustavo Dardlem and his team examined an extraordinarily robust Chinese alligator skull and determined via CT scanning that it was likely its own species, which they named Alligator munensis. It was discovered in the same layer as the remains of a water buffalo and sambar deer, giving us an idea of what it would have fed on in life. The new species has a shorter, thicker skull and fewer teeth than the Chinese alligator, and morphological analysis implies that it had a crushing bite adapted for hard-shelled prey items. It's adorable, but it would also be happy to rip your head off. Crocodilians really are the best of both worlds. While you may have seen my analysis on how Cenozoic megafauna would fare in the Triassic period, I'm happy to report that we don't need to rely on speculative ecology for our childish fantasies of dinosaurs fighting mammals. Han et al. describe an incredible find. 
a Repenomamus, a badger-sized Gobicondodontid, locked in a death match with the early Ceratopsian Psittacosaurus. We'd found remnants of hatchling Psittacosaurus inside Repenomamus stomachs before, but this is the first time that two adults had been discovered in combat. The amazing fossil was from the Yizhan Formation in China, one already well known for its extraordinarily dense Psittacosaurus population. I don't blame the Repenomamus at all. If there was such an abundant food source, why not go for it? The preservation shows that the mammal was gripping the much larger animal's jaw and biting its ribs when all of a sudden a fast-moving lava flow buried them both. While the authors say that scavenging was a possibility, they also mention it was very unlikely given the position of the animals and the lack of scavenging marks on the Psittacosaurus itself. I've got to admit, it's difficult to get more awesome than a dino versus mammal showdown in a chaotic volcanic landscape. Our final mention is short and sweet. I know how excited you are to get to August. Zhang Zhuo et al. described two new saber-toothed cat species from Pliocene Africa, Locotunjailurus chinsmae and Dinophilus wordelini. They were described from the Langibanweg quarry in South Africa and are part of a half-dozen saber-toothed cat species in the area, confirming the study's claim that it really was an evolutionary hotspot for saber-tooths. Thanks to Edge for having me as part of the event this year. Now make sure to watch the rest and comment with your favorite discovery of 2023. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.